Jamestown, Virginia is more than a location on the map. It is also an important place in history. In 1607, a full 13 years before the Pilgrims land at Plymouth Rock, 104 men and boys begin constructing James Fort on a small island 30 miles upriver from the Chesapeake Bay. It will become the first permanent English settlement on the North American mainland. The early settlers left numerous written accounts of successes and failures they met with while living in James Fort. But eyewitness reports can only tell part of the story. Today, we will let James Fort tell its own story as revealed by the archaeologists of the Jamestown Rediscovery Project. This is Jamestown on Earth. First time I came out here, I, I was struck by the river uh, and, the, and, the, and the island and, and the marshes that were here. And the marshes, all just sort of the, the natural uh, land. Uh, and, I, and, when I, and I came in the summer, and for, I remember walking across, there was a bridge, there's a little bridge out across the marsh to the site. And I understood immediately what it was like to be here in 1607. It was hot, and you could hear the bugs buzzing around you, you know, you, from the marshes. Uh, and then also the, the impact of, of living on this, they called it a river. You look across this thing that's here, you'd swear it's a sea. I mean, it's a huge, huge body of water. And so everything made sense why, why this was uh, the first place to, to become a permanent settlement. The English were very concerned that if the Spanish found the settlement, then they would send warships and, and destroy, uh, destroy the colony. Uh, and they were instructed by the Virginia Company of London. This was the company, that, that uh, company of merchants who sponsored the, the Jamestown colony. Uh, they were instructed to settle uh, well inland, up a, a large river. And Jamestown is about 50, 60 miles up the James River. Well, for about 200 years, people all assumed that James Fort was located on the western end of the island, the extreme western end from here. Uh, which had experienced a lot of river erosion. A lot of shore was gone down there. So the conventional wisdom said that, that therefore the fort's gone, and that the church had been moved to this site. Well, there was what, a question that I came up with, saying, what if it wasn't moved? The original church was in the fort, so the fort ought to be here. We knew from the written descriptions that we had a triangular fort. Uh, we knew something about the measurements of that, and we knew that there were bulwarks or bastions at the corners um, where the cannons sat. Um, the Zuniega map, which is a Spanish spy map by a guy named Pedro Zuniega um, that was sent back to Spain, may have been a copy of one of John Smith's maps, but that map has the only rendering of James Fort that we actually um, have to go by. It's a very sort of cartoony rendering of the fort, but it does show that it's triangular with bastions at the corners. It was pretty clear from historical records and descriptions from eyewitness accounts from the time period that there was a triangular enclosure here. So we had to find three walls. That's one thing. The other thing is that connected along these walls and within holes in the ground that had been dug for cellars or a well, other pieces, uh, wound up having uh, things in them, artifacts. Uh, and these artifacts can be dated. If you're at the site of James Fort, you would find something that dates as old as, um, the, as the fort, 400 years, and things that were mili of military-like nature. We had to really find a lot of evidence to prove that, that this was, in fact, the spot where everything began. You know, this is the Pocahontas, the John Smith place. Uh, and uh, so it took several years to get enough pieces of the walls of the fort to go together to align to make a triangle. And that didn't even, that didn't really happen for at least 10 years. The archeology span of the fort has told us that it matches very closely, almost exactly to the descriptions by William Strakey of the measurements of the fort. Um, if you had those, those measurements meet up in the corners and then incise the bulwark around that. Um, earlier, we had thought that it, the description of the measurements went to 
the curtains of the fort, which are the straight sides, and we were adding the bulwark shapes to that, so we had our fort a little bit larger than um, the way it actually turned out to be, uh, which matches the documents very closely. We had a general idea of what the fort looked like from the eyewitness accounts from the documentary records. But what the archaeology has allowed us to understand, we have a much better sense of the dimensions of the fort and also a much better sense of the buildings within the fort and the layout of, of, the, of the buildings inside. We didn't really know too much about that. We always knew the fort was three-sided, triangular, uh, and we knew something of how big it was. But the archaeology has given us much more precision. We've got a much more accurate view of what the fort looked like. Now that archaeologists have found the location of James Fort, there still remain lots of questions, such as what was life like for the early settlers and how did they live? Fortunately, many of them wrote about their experiences in letters and diaries, but the written record only tells us part of the story. The things they left in the ground give us important clues that tell us about the lives of these people who lived almost 400 years ago. Now it's up to professional archaeologists and Summerfield School students from the Jamestown Rediscovery Project to carefully unearth this evidence and tell us what it means. What archaeologists look for are layers upon layers. I said, in, in, in with the assumption that the lowest layer that's covered up is is the oldest in time, and as time passes, things build up on top of other things. Um, so it's very essential for us to determine which of these layers we find is covering up or, or, or sealing, as we call it, over others. When you dig a site, you don't just dig a hole anywhere you want to. We actually don't dig down, we dig across a site. So we're actually taking down layers of soil over a site at the same time. We're not just digging a hole straight down. So a context is a particular layer of soil that has a certain color to it or has certain um, bits of brick or shell in it that distinguish it from other layers of soil. We just excavate one layer at a time, keeping the artifacts from each layer together, and that, that is its context. The remains of, of James Ford are, are are remains of where wooden timbers have been put in the ground, and then they decay and, and they're gone, but they still leave a different color soil. So what we do is we remove what we call a plow zone. This whole site after the, the town had pretty much disappeared from here went into farming, and so plows come along and they go down a certain depth in soil and blend. So in that case, we couldn't find anything in place, but taking that upper 10 inches off, digging it off and cleaning off below, we were able to find the dark soil stains, we call it, of where upright, side-by-side, -side, log posts had been that formed the fort wall. What happens here, guys, is that um, to dig these things, they just, they just, just like a barrier, you dig through the hard orange subsoil. This is one of the first features put in the ground out here, so there's no, they're not digging through anything, any old, any earlier features. When they were building this, uh, this slot trench for the palisade, they dug this narrow trench down about three four feet or, or so, then they put their posts in, and then they packed that very same orange clay that they had just dug out to make the trench, packed that in around the post. That's what's going on there. Everything that happens to the property leaves an impact on the landscape. One of them, major one, was a, a, a Civil War shore battery that was protected by an earthen wall, a rampart. And that was built in 1861. The construction of the earthwork itself, the, with the dirt pile to, to, to protect the guns, was scraped away from the sides, from each side, and, and piled up on the on, on a play, on an area that they thought would be the wall. That's bad news because that that digs away the 1607 material. But the good news is that it, it, it's also piled upon uh, a place that they didn't scour out. So that is then protected from 1861 until we remove that dirt. It's protected. It's like a time capsule. 
over in the Confederate Fort area, what we had to dig down was through the 1861 earthworks, which was mainly a lot of uh, fill and a lot of clay, but you would have to get down in what they call the plow zone. And then the plow zone of loose soil, you would find brook bits and oyster bits, and that's when you would find pieces of ceramic and you know, datable artifacts. And once we get that down, then we're at the topsoil for the 1607 fort. But it takes about a good five feet worth of digging to get down to that layer. Well, we've got Aaron over here shoveling dirt for us that we pulled out of from the uh, Confederate earthworks. And she's tossed it in the screen so we can press it through and just pull out all the artifacts. Since it's automated, it's a lot easier for us. It takes a lot less time and a lot less energy. In, in the beginning, like just r running into an artifact is really neat because uh, we didn't really get a sense of how much we actually do find out here. And, you know, um, my first unit, I guess my first artifact was a nail and I was pretty excited that I even found it. But um, uh, we were really taking screens and screens of artifacts. Like we were filling in three or four bags a day and that was just only parts of one layer one strata so it was really exciting that we're finding so many different things and then when we run into pottery the glaze is still on it and um, you know it was just really exciting because then you get into trying to identify it and then every time you see something you recognize you're like oh man I recognize that that's such and such and so you know it's, it makes you feel really good about knowing things that were in existence like back 400 years ago. We keep a lot of the oyster shell because it can help us understand their diets of the early colonists. Um, and if you can see on this one, it has all these little small bores that have been drilled into it. That's from a bacteria. And depending on the size of the borehole, we can tell where it's coming from in the river, which helps us understand where they're going to get their food source, how they might be trading with other native populations that live in the area, and things like that. They can also be dated to a certain degree uh, by their hinges is this part of the shell right there. The things that we wanted to find from the site, of course, were, are the outlines of the fort, the buildings that were built inside, and what was the nature and, um, of them, of these buildings, uh, and what were they used for, and also uh, to find the water source, which would be a well. And, there, and in the records, uh, John Smith said he dug the first well of sweet water, it was called. And, um, uh, and that was, that was a, a saving grace because Drinking the river was not all that healthy here. It's, it's brackish, it has some salt in it, and that can kill you over time. By mid-1610, uh, the, the new secretary of the colony, a fellow by the name of William Strachey, says that the well has gone bad, that there is uh, a type of murky water oozing into the well. Um, so that's mid-1610, about a year and a half after the well is first built. What happens in a well, uh, or with a well, is that shortly after the well is constructed, of course, you have individuals drawing water from it. While they're doing that, uh, inevitably accidents happen. Pots fall in, um, buckets break off, things accidentally find their way in the well. Um, that'll be at the bottom of the well, those things. At some point, the well, they will no longer be able to draw water from the well. And that is uh, usually when the colonists begin to throw all of their trash into the well. And so, in other words, it goes straight from being a well um, to drink from to a hole in the ground to throw your trash in. We have no artifacts that post-date or are after um, the date of 1610 thus far, which suggests to us that this well might have been filled as early as 1610. Of course, if tomorrow we find a, a coin dated 1611, then we know this well was filled after 1611. What we find as archaeologists are people's trash, things that people threw away or lost, um, not thinking that 400 years later somebody's going to find that and look at it and try to interpret what life was like. So there's no forethought, there's no thinking, oh, I'm going to bury this so people will find it and think this about me. But when people write letters or diaries or accounts, they all have a personal point of view, a personal bias. They're trying to convince people to think a certain way. So they're, in a way, archaeology's you know, a little, little better. But if you use the two together, you use the written record, which we can do in historical archaeology, and the artifacts, that gives you the full picture. That helps you understand life. Life at Jamestown 
is much different, I think, than most people have in, in their mind. Uh, by the artifacts that we found, we are kind of understanding that it wasn't a real neat place. There was probably stuff all over the ground. If you broke a pot, you dropped it, it would sit there. <laughs> it wouldn't be swept up and put tidily away like we do in our life today. Um, we also have found that there are things from all over the world there. It, not just English things, but they had things from China and from other parts of Europe, France, Italy, and Spain. They used objects from everywhere. The first step in processing artifacts once they're excavated is that they come in from the field in bags that have their context written on them. So everything comes in in their context and they're maintained that way throughout uh, the processing procedure. First step is that they're washed and then all the artifacts are sorted out by material within that context though, they always stay in that group. Um, then the ceramics are numbered, and the reason for that is because we may want to take the ceramics out of their context, out of the group that they came in with, and try to mend them with other groups. And we don't want to lose track of where they, where they came from. Then once that has happened, the objects come to me for entering everything onto the computer. So I'm cataloging, I'm saying what everything is, identifying it. Then we do um, mending, more mending, trying to get objects to go together. We pull the metal objects, particularly the iron, the ones that we want to uh, preserve to a greater extent. So we pull out the interesting metal objects and then they go to the conservator for conservation. This is conservation work and we take items that are made of iron and we clean all of the rust off of them using aluminum oxide and the air braking machine which is basically the aluminum oxide powder and uh, air, and it's shot out at a high speed, and it helps clean off all of the rust. This pot is very interesting. Um, I'm working now and trying to get it more together. But if you look very closely, you'll see a woven design here. What we think this is, is a basket, an Indian basket, um, that a potter, an Englishman, uh, pushed clay into, into the inside, and it took on the impression of the basket, and then they f he fired the pot to make it harden, and the basket burned off, and then he's left with this nice design. We know that despite some rumors or myths that these early settlers were quite lazy, we actually know from, from the evidence at Jamestown that far from it, they were extremely busy, uh, and uh, uh, worked very hard to make the early colony successful. And we also know that Indian peoples were regular visitors to the fort, so the archaeology gives us a much better sense of the day-to-day -day life of what was going on uh, within, within the fort during these, these years. We're finding thousands of pieces of scrap copper, and in the past, People have thought that these pieces of copper were associated with the Native American trade. Uh, John Smith and a lot of the other early colonists, they write about how copper was exchanged along with glass beads to the Native Americans. And through my investigations um, that are both physical in nature but then also chemical, exploring the chemical composition of the copper, I've been finding out that this copper is telling us a lot more than uh, just information about the Native American trade. Bottom line, it was being used as an ingredient to help the colonists find a source of zinc ores, which would have been then used at home in the production of brass. What my research has shown is that, by and large, at least 70% of the copper that we uncover here at Jamestown originated from English mines. Now, the interesting thing about knowing where this copper comes from is the administrators and the shareholders in these copper companies are the same gentlemen that start the Virginia Company. So there's a connection between the colonization effort and those industrial endeavors in England at the time period. Artifacts, location and space and time is everything to us as archaeologists. Essentially it's evidence and where that evidence is placed is key in our interpretation, our final interpretation or analysis of the site. The transit allows us to look at uh, the archaeological, the uh, material use of space over time uh, and, and catalog that space as we dig down in uh, three-dimensional coordinates. We actually have a, a pocket PC 
that we collect all the data so that we can see it in real time. We take that into the lab and download it onto a, a AutoCAD and then we look at that data and it's referenced to the other information on the site and then we actually create uh, shape files or, or shapes of the features and put those on a geographic information system. So for us it's a very advanced system of, of retrieval, data archiving and uh, will be the legacy of this project. And so what we're learning through archaeology is that they came here with very specific instructions and they carried out those instructions. And certainly there were periods of time where they uh, ran into things that were unexpected. They didn't find gold. They didn't find some of the minerals they were looking for. They ran into a drought situation. Um, we know through some, some archaeology that was done on the archaeological assessment out here, um, which would have affected what there was to eat and would have affected their trade relations um, as well. So Jamestown almost failed, but it ultimately succeeded. What if Jamestown had failed uh, and been abandoned? Uh, what if uh, the English had left Jamestown in the winter of 1607 or perhaps the following year or the year after that? The modern United States very much derives from English traditions of law and politics, uh, religious beliefs and so on, culture, traditions. That wouldn't have happened in my view if, uh, if Jamestown hadn't survived. So we can't prove any of this because Jamestown did survive. But uh, my guess is without Jamestown, we'd be living in a very different America today.